bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Holland Blurview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone Partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. All right, today's webinar is titled The Net Worth of Networks, and today is the second uh, in sort of a, an informal series of webinars that we're doing uh, in partnership with uh, CIHR, the Canadian Institute for Health Research, and the Institute for Human Development, Child and Youth Health. Uh, they developed a program to identify research chairs in, re in reproductive and child health services and policy research, and this is our second uh, program. We had Alison McPherson and uh, her colleague, Dr. Linda Roth. In, uh, last a uh, couple weeks ago talking about uh, child injury uh, and uh, today we have uh, our second presentation from that series and we'll be welcoming uh, Dr. Prakash Shah. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Shah. He's a professor in the Department of Pediatrics uh, and Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Uh, he also holds the applied chair, uh, research chair from CIHR in reproductive and child health services research. And he's also currently the director of the Canadian Neonatal Network, uh, commonly known as CNN. And, an inter and he's also the director of the International Network for Evaluation of Outcomes of Neonates, or INEO, which is what we're going to hear more about today. So it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to Dr. Shaw. Hey, thank, thank you, Doug. And... Uh, I, uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody, and uh, welcome to the seminar, and thank you for having me. So what I'm hoping today is to give you a Canadian and international experience on uh, networking and how we have evolved from in the networking uh, section, networking part of our activity and how what, what use that we have accomplished and contemplating to get even more. So I have nothing, no conflicts to resolve. And uh, my objective today is to learn what and how of networking, to review national as well as international experience, and to understand benefits as well as challenges of uh, such large networks. So what is a network? Network is a group of individual organizations or agencies who are organized on a non-hierarchical common issues or concern. And I think in the healthcare domain, this is the most important world that we are organized in a non-hierarchical issue, non-hierarchical fashion, and we all pursue proactively and systematically and uh, the question or the problems at hand, and with the commitment and trust from all its members and their partners. I think if you go with this kind of a notion that gives a responsibility, creativity, as well as the dependency on all the members of the network. And the idea behind creating such a network is to build some social capital, encourage and foster collective values. Doesn't matter whether you are a trainee or whether you are a professor emeritus. And the system that uh, we have developed is designed for evolution because uh, you will see over time what uh, in the last 15, 20 years we've accomplished. And we continually evolve our system to make sure that we are up to the pace with the, what happens in the technology. And my, my reason is that uh, there are a lot of uh, initiatives in which data are collected. And they are all over. Everybody wants the data. Everybody collects the data. And until the data is converted and passed, it traverses through the process of either information, developing community, developing collaboration, and creating knowledge, which leads us to some degree of wisdom. It's just sitting data. And what I'll do is walk you through this process. In no way we are wise, but I will show you how we are reaching towards understanding of uh, nuances of the care that is being provided at different places. So to start with the national experience, we I'm the director of Canadian Neonatal Network, which many of you might know. 
was established in 1995 by Dr. Shu Li out of Vancouver. And at that time, we started with uh, 16 neonatal units collaborating and uh, working together to send information data on a baby's care in the neonatal units across Canada. With a mission that uh, we want to be a Canadian network of Canadian multi-professional, multidisciplinary researchers who conduct leading collaborative research dedicated to improvement of neonatal, perinatal, prenatal health and healthcare in Canada, as well as internationally. And this mission statement still holds true 15 years, 20 years down the road. We are truly a national uh, network uh, in the sense that uh, there are 30 level 3 neonatal intensive care units across the country and all 30 neonatal units are member of our network. And that has ha not happened overnight. It has taken this many years. In 96-97 uh, it was 17 units out of 26 functional units at that time. And then once the initial grant went completed for over two years, we saw dwindling of the center participation. And then creativity and uh, innovation was needed to bring back everybody together. So since 2010 onwards, we are on truly national. And I will show you the progress that we have made in that aspect. What we do as a network, our core is benchmarking and trends that uh, we evaluate ourselves, we compare ourselves, benchmark ourselves, and produce trends in uh, practices and outcomes in neonates. In addition, we do a lot of research. However, we what we have evolved or what we have diverged into is a quality improvement. And that's becoming our main focus in the last uh, few years. In addition, we train a lot of, stu lot of uh, students we do a lot of health service evaluation to an extent that we are basically the source. If anything, any ministry or any government official needs regarding the neonatal care in the country, international collaboration and advocacy like this with the CAFC. And I'll walk you through snippets of all this activity in a very, very short burst because it's there is no way I can justify giving the entire range of activity that we do within a year, within an hour. As far as benchmarking and trend evaluation is concerned, we compare these different neonatal units in this aspect that uh, we look at the different outcomes that we are worried about in the preterm infants. And uh, the units are labeled as A, B, C, D to up to A. And this is an example of looking at dosocomial infection per 1,000 patient day among patients who are less than 33 weeks. The horizontal bar is a network average, so the units can look at their rate and decide whether they want to focus on that particular aspect to bring their rate of infection below that horizontal bar. And this is a constant endeavor that we do through what we, what we have is the core of our data collection, which is our database. Our database is a customized data entry program with standard definitions and protocols. This is collected by trained research assistant, research nurses, coordinators at local site, and it is the responsibility of the site to identify, fund, and train that particular individual. The data is uploaded through web to central server. Our original copy is retained at the local hospital containing identifiers, because the identifiers are not being sent. And as I mentioned, data collection is supported by participating hospitals. And uh, what we do uh, with, that, with those data on an annual as well as sometimes semi-annual basis is benchmarking on major outcomes. We produce some trend analysis. At the moment, we are anonymous in reporting. As you saw in the previous slide, we are identifying sites with A, B, C, B. So at this stage, what I can tell you, we have converted data into information. And uh, the units, of course, are not of similar size. These are the CNN hospitals. 27 hospitals for 2012 report. And as you can see, we have units which are less than, who cares for less than 100 patients, and there are units who care for more than 1,000 patients. There are units which are children's hospital dealing with outborn babies, and there are units which deal with a mix, mixed types of babies. 
So we are different, and that's why we do a lot of activity to make sure that we are comparing apples to apples and oranges to orange. This is one example. This graph is showing you the composite outcome of mortality or major morbidity. What you are seeing on the y-axis is the standardized ratio of uh, death or major morbidity, and the one being that your observed over expected rate of this complication is equal. If your observed rate is higher than one, then you will fall on the top part of the graph. If your observed rate is lower than one, you will fall on the bottom part of the graph. The two pink lines are the 95% confidence limit. So even if you are above, you can see whether you are crossing that 95% confidence limit or not. And on the x-axis are the expected death or major morbidities. So by this, what I'm trying to show you is that the units which are larger are on the right side, units which are of medium size are in the middle, and units which are smaller are on the left side. So you can see when your unit is smaller, the confidence limit is also higher, so that they, because you have a standardized ratio of 0.2, like this site number 20, doesn't mean that you are the lowest performer, you are still within confidence max. Another point I want to make is that uh, despite differences in individual outcomes, as you can see, all 30 units are following within this 95% confidence met. So if you have a larger sample size, you have a lower confidence limit, but you are still within that confidence limit. Meaning thereby, with the practice, the care that we provide, ultimately results in a survival free of disability at a similar rate in different parts of the country despite the size of the unit. And this kind of benchmarking helps because when we look at individual outcome, the units decide what they want to focus as, as on an ongoing basis. So this is what we published every year. These are the examples of the nine last nine annual reports. These are available publicly on canadianneonatalnetwork.org. Many, not only the researchers, but the administrator, hospital professionals, they go look at their site look at their site's performance in relation to the entire network and support the activities that is happening in the unit. Again, this is used not only nationally, even internationally, people go and look at the outcomes and compare themselves. On an ongoing basis, on a five-year rotation basis, we also compare what is happening to the babies across the country. And this is the survival of uh, babies who are extremely preterm, meaning they're by less than 23 weeks, 23, 24, 25, 26. And as you can see, we have been steady improvement in 23 weeks. 20, 24 weeks is showing sudden drastic improvement over the last few years. 25 and 26 are 80 to 90 percent survival rate. So this is what we continually analyze feedback, at not only outcome level but practice level as well. We also have an on on like a reporting portal where uh, the site can log on and look at their own our own data in terms of what is happening to their mortality. They can look at on only their hospital, which is represented in blue, and orange is the entire network. So they can compare what is happening in the entire country as compared to their unit and where their fo focus should be in terms of improving the quality or improving the outcome for that particular, in that particular domain. So this is available to each site on a regular basis and uh, they can log in. So administrators love this because any time in the middle of the year they want to see oh, what is our infection rate, they can just quickly log on and see those rates. So that's benchmarking. We also do a lot of research, and, that, and uh, as, as evident from this graph, that uh, we publish our research activity on a very on very significantly positive way, with uh, at least 10 to 12 papers every year, with the 20 in last year, and four already. With the, we have been only one and a half month into the 2016. The type of research we do is uh, related to prediction, care provision, health services, epidemiological, and currently we are focusing on quality and outcomes improvement. And I'll give you a little bit of each one of that. For prediction, we create curves like this. This is a prediction of survival without morbidity in infants less than 33 weeks gestation. 
So on the x-axis is the gestational age, on the y-axis is the birth weight in grams. The left one is for the female, the right one is for the male, and the color coding is showing you that what is the probability of that baby going without any major morbidity. So for example, a baby who is born at 25 weeks gestation, if the baby is 500 gram, he falls at blue, which is 10%, but if it is 750 gram, it falls between turquoise, and that is basically 20%. So this information is important at the time of birth, and a baby is born a 25 week 750 gram boy, that we can predict what happens to this baby. At the same time, if a baby is born at 750 gram, but of a different gestational age, you can see the prediction of survival without major morbidity changes based on the gestational age that a baby is born. So this, this information is very useful because it can provide information for counseling right at birth. Because we know the gestation, we know birth weight, and we know sex. It's not a complicated formula. We also have developed several other prediction tools where babies can be identified to have mild morbidity, severe morbidity, or mortality based on certain characteristics and the prediction model. And we train a lot of students. So Wenji is, uh, was our biosat student, and she developed this model. And uh, I'm pleased to say that based on her capacity to develop such models, she was picked up by TD Bank to predict their stocks on an ongoing basis. In terms of care provision, we identify what is the best care, pro pro care provision that uh, leads to the lowest outcome. So Yan Yu was a PhD fellow from China who came and looked at the admission temperature. So what is the admission temperature that we should be targeting? And as you can see from this fetid cow, the probability of uh, outcomes, adverse outcome was lowest when temperature was between 36.2 and 37.4. As it goes lower, the probability of adverse outcome increases. And as the temperature goes higher, the probability also increases. And this gives the guidance as to the units that what is the ideal temperature that they should be maintaining these babies. We also, this was my first venture when uh, we looked at the babies admitted to the freestanding pediatric hospital versus tertiary care units. So as you may know, that 20% of our preterm babies in Canada are being born outside of the tertiary centers. And when they are transferred to the Tertiary care, tertiary care centers, they may go to the neonatal units, which are the perinatal units associated, as well as children hospital. And we identified that if they go to the children hospital, there is higher risk of death. And based on this, some policy changes were made in terms of any baby who is born less than 32 weeks should preferentially go to the perinatal centers rather than children hospital if beds are available. So we do influence practices. We have seen significant improvement in our outcome. This is nosocomial infection. That has uh, over seven years, what we have identified that uh, the infection has been slowly, slowly decreasing from 4.5 per thousand patient days to now 3.5. And that translates to a lot of babies passing through the NIC without infection. In terms of epidemiological research, we look at uh, what happens. So this is John, Dr. Jonathan Hellman, who looked at uh, how babies die in neonatal units across country. So this was a prospective evaluation where everybody collected data when there was a, then there was a death in the NICU. And we identified that in 84% of the case, the neonatal death occur after discussion regarding withdrawal for life-sustaining life treatment whereas 16% happen without any discussion. And with that, we identified what are the main causes. So extreme prematurity was the main cause of death in preterm babies, whereas birth asphyxia was the main cause of death in term neonates. And that allows us to understand and realize and target this, active, this particular outcomes. We also have created a reference curve for the head cuff circumference. So this is N. Monique Newt and one of our students with the Montreal Children's Hospital database as well as our database, we combined and produce what should be the ideal birth head circumference and what should we be targeting when the babies are traversing through our neonatal unit. 
we also looked at uh, what is happening to the twins and triplets, as many of you might know, that there are policy changes that are occurring at the national as well as international level regarding the in vitro fertilization. And that's what Kate, who was an epidemiologist working with us, observed that the number of triplets have gone down in Canada, whereas number of twins has slowly and steadily increased over the last, over five year period need to identify and reorganize services to make sure that we cater for what, what is going to come. In terms of health service evaluation, as I mentioned, we have been asked for a lot of people, as well as uh, Gary who was one of the medical students. He came and he was under the impression that uh, universal, despite the universal healthcare system, why are we having different outcomes for the children when they go out in the community? And he thought, let's look at the neonatal intensive care unit. So we looked at and we compared the outcome of the babies when who were born to mothers living in the na different neighborhoods based on income quintile. So the Q5 was the, the lowest income quintile. And when we compared to the highest versus lowest or intermediate, we identified that as far as babies are concerned who are admitted to the neonatal unit, their outcome was not different at discharge irrespective of uh, their neighborhood income that they were living. So what happens in the neonatal unit is that when the babies are admitted, they are not differentially treated based on their econo socioeconomic status. The factors that affect their outcome probably are the postnatal factors. So that gives us a kind of confidence in our healthcare system that we have, that uh, we are doing what we are supposed to do in terms of universal healthcare system. We also identified higher mortality rates among infants who are admitted at night time. And based on this, there are several changes have been made in, in the type of attendance, type of people who are present at the evening times to improve. And I'm pleased to say that in the recent analysis, we did not find difference between day and night in terms of the outcomes of the babies. We are also asked constantly by the province as to what is the status of the level two, level three beds across the provinces in the Canada and where is the allocation and where should we be putting more money or more beds by province comparing the outcomes based on the provinces. In addition, we do a lot of training and mentoring. We invite and host trainees at all levels, graduate, residents, fellows. So this is another plea. If you are if you are interested, we are happy to accommodate you. You also have a lot of international trainees, masters, PhD, biostat, GIS. So this is not just remain clinical. It has expanded swings. In terms of advocacy, we do advocate for small babies and uh, with the help of Elaine, as well as Marilyn Booth and James Malos at uh, PCMCH and Katrina Stobe and Kate Robson at the Canadian Preterm Birth Foundation. With the help of those these people, we have advocated a lot of things for the babies. Many of you may know now the employment insurance special benefits are is available to neonatal patients and the, their parents too meaning thereby mother's maternity leave and its benefit would start once the baby reaches home. And during the period that baby is admitted to the intensive care unit, she will get EI benefit as a special benefit. So this was a combined effort done by the Canadian Preterm Birth Foundation, the Provincial Council, CAFC, and we lobbied it with the government, and it is now law. So. We also celebrate the World Prematurity Day on November 17, where you might see all everywhere, all the monuments across the world is enlightened and purple to support the preterm birth because 75% of the fatalities are preventable. However, just want to spend a little more time in the quality improvement aspect because that is what has kept our network going and we have ventured. And so as you may have recognized, we have created data, we have led, led to information, created community. Now we needed to collaborate with this community to work together to improve. So our motto is to bring the guy who is sitting at the bottom of bottom on the tree branch to up and not to pull the bottom guy to the down. And I'll show you. So this was a, what we what we call evidence-based practice for quality improvement it was an effort of a lot of people and a, a CIHR team in maternal infant care that worked diligently over the last 10 years. 
and it stemmed from this slide. This was a paper published in CMAJ reporting variation in mortality in Canadian NICUs. And as you can see, there are units which have significantly low mortality and units which have significantly high mortality. And we wanted to see why. Why should this be a different? So what we developed was a, an evidence-based practice identification quality improvement model, which was based on input, which comes from the data and the reviews of, of potentially better practices. Processes, which is analysis and plan that uh, we, I will show you in a minute. And then output, which is implementation of those plan and auditing and getting the data and reviews. With that concept, what we wanted to do was to promote dialogue between lots of NICU teams across the Canada, share and evaluate the, our data, share best practices, and share intervention. Everybody is doing fantastic job in one or two things, and I think it's important that we learn from each other. What we first, first process we did was we reviewed all the evidence as to what works. We collected local data. We collected network data. Then we had a lot of dialogue as to what should we be, what should we be calling as a best practices. How can we share practices with the team, and how can we target the practices that are applicable to local culture and tents? Then we train the team to implement change in their unit, to measure and audit the effect of those change, and then at the central level, we fed back the data back to them. So it, it has been a journey, and I will convince you at the end that this was a great collaboration. We call it EPIC 1 between 2 and 5, EPIC PHSI, supposed uh, system improvement, implementation improvement 6 to 8, EPIC 2, which is 8 to 13, and currently we are running EPIC 3, which is going on from 14 to 17. So EPIC 1 was a cluster randomized control trial where we basically got the people together, lots of emails, lots of shared objectives, face-to-face -face meetings, site visit, review presentation, we listed best practices, tracked the data, and shared experiences. So in this, we randomized 12 NICUs, half to work on nosocomial infection and half to work on BPD, which is the bronchopulmonary dysplasia, one of the deadly complication that occurs because of lung immaturity in preterm infants. And we told them, you just work on infection, you just work on in BPD, and there were five NICU who said that they don't have resources, so they acted as a control. So with this 3,000 babies in each arm and 1,000 control baby, what we found, those units who were working for infection had significant reduction in infection, one-third, 34%. And with infection, they also were able to reduce the lung complication because they go hand in hand. So there was 44% reduction in BPD. Those working for BPD had 15% reduction in BPD, no change in infection for obvious reason. However, importantly, the control group had no change. So this basically showed us that this is effective. In this process, we did not tell any unit what they should do. We just gave them the practices that these are the best practices. You evaluate some of which you may not be, may be doing, some of which you may not be doing, and then decide which practice you want to change, adapt, and adopt. But we identified that intervention targeting one outcome may affect and be beneficial on other outcome. And most importantly, it may be more effective and less costly than conducting a single intervention randomized control trial. So what, what we learned from the first one that uh, to do any kind of improvement, we need to be immersively engaged. So that those units who were working, it's not that those control units didn't have access to those potentially better practices from literature. They did, but they did not do anything in terms of immersive engagement and in, involving into the learning how to do quality improvement, learning how to change, and learning how to implement those changes. So we were very happy in 2005. We thought, oh, nation is on the right track and everybody should be happy. And we just said, okay, let's put our guards down. However, what we wanted to see is that does this effect sustain and continue? In that process, what we identified that there are people who were not participating, they all got to wink of it and they all say, oh, wow, we need to do this. We need to learn about this. 
Now 23 units wanted to participate, 11 in the original trial and other 12 units which were not in the trial. So we had a one workshop, trained them, we showed them these are the changes that other hospitals have made and then said, okay, go ahead, do it, do it yourself. We are not going to interfere what you do and we'll see what happens over two years because we thought we were, we were, we were very productive and this is what happened. In the hospitals who did not participate in an immersive engagement way into quality improvement, constant reminder, constant feedback, auditing of their activities, there was no change. The hospitals which created teams, which had a quality improvement activity ongoing, which had members who are engaged and active, significantly continued to show benefit. So what we basically concluded from this is that just having potentially best practices list or some kind of document does not do much unless you are immersively engaged and learning how to do quality improvement activity and continue to do so, then only you will be able to do. If you don't do it, you won't understand that. So then we thought this cannot happen, this cannot sustain. So we launched what we call EPIC 2, which ran from 2008 to 2013. This was an effort to engage all NICUs in the country we wanted to target high-risk babies, which are less than 29 weeks. And we also wanted to target other morbidities, such as, such as retinopathy or prematurity, necrotizing enterocolitis, and brain injury. And we also want to see that uh, does it affect neurodevelopmental outcome on an ongoing basis? Otherwise, it probably does not make sense. So that's why we had a five-year time frame. In this, basically, we have went back to the basics, reviewed all the, each morbidity and all the practices. Yeah. We developed a virtual research community where people can post their practice changes, people post the checklist that they develop, people post any other activity that or any activity that they have done and came to develop a bundle, they will post it and other sites were free to just take it, modify it and implement it rather than inventing the wheel. I can tell you people have uh, even posted videos on how to help mothers to express breast milk. So other people don't have to develop the video, they just put those videos in their labor floor when the moms were delivering kind of thing. We developed some uh, EPIC indicators. We had a lot of training workshops, regional conferences. So the workshop happened every yearly. And just to give you an example, this is a process why in one unit, it took 14 steps before baby will receive surfactant. A surfactant is, a, is, is an agent which will open up the lungs and allow ease of ventilation to if the baby is requiring mechanical ventilation. And it took them 14 steps because there were pro problems at their site. There were two programs, there were two budgets, there were some old criteria how to give surfactant. They needed x-ray before they give surfactant. There were old protocols. There was supply problem, storage problem. Surfactant was not available where the baby was born. You need to ask physician, then RT can give, but the surfactant is sitting with pharmacists. So there was like a lot of chaos. So we asked the site to go identify barriers to change, develop a process for improvement. So they reviewed their literature, they set up working group, they identified the obstacles, they obtained agreement from pharmacy to locate surfactant in their case room and develop procedure that will allow respiratory therapies to administer. And re, 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 reworked on that protocol, and this was the target. So this is nothing, we did nothing at the central level. This is the local development of the criteria, local development of indicator, and they said we our target is 30 minutes, and this is what happened. In their average time of administration of surfactant went down from 100 down to nearly 30. Over the, and this is where they introduced the EPIC cycle. Sorry, EPIC cycle. This is where they introduced the EPIC cycle. And as you can see, there was a steady improvement in what they wanted to achieve. So this is one of the things that every site do. Like the, every, every, every uh, that site's contemplated. It's not only that particular care. People looked at their care processes and identified obstacles, identified barriers, and selected that this is the site uh, PDSS cycle that I will do. We ask them to do at least three to four cycles 
every year and then come back every year and report which cycles you did, what have you developed. So other 30 teams listened to that and understood what they are developing and then they directly communicated with the respective sites so that the, the efforts were not duplicated. As you can see now, we have created collaboration and needed to convert into the knowledge. So 25 hospitals participated from 2008 to 2012. And what we found was that the composite outcome, which is the mortality or major morbidity, went down by 37% in the entire country. And particularly what we identified that majority of improvement occurred in 26 to 28 weeks with a very tiny baby, which is less than 26 weeks. We still have some work to do. And when we looked at individual outcomes, we identified that our retinopathy of prematurity necrotizing enterocolitis and infection were the three major outcomes in which we made a significant progress. We didn't do much in mortality, neurological injury, or BPD. And that's what we wanted to target. So with that, we didn't want to let our guards down like the previous experience. We wanted to continue. So what we launched, and during this process, people were coming and presenting the data. And I can tell you, we also had a lot of international sites coming, like American sites coming and presenting the data. And we had a site which presented data that they had no infection in their unit for last three years, like 1,000 days without infection. And we thought, why can't we target zero? So that's the motto for EPIC-3 is to drive to zero. So to build on success of the first two efforts, sustain the QI effort, develop true sense of collaborative engagement, and empower units with sustainable QI methodology. Don't want to bore you with the, this details, but we have a roadmap in which one of the different things that we are doing is we are asking sites to go to another site and spend one day. So we have linked the sites which are targeting the outcome. So every site is targeting now two outcomes. We have linked them with the site which has a ray outcome rate lower than their rate and has similar setup and ask them, you go there, spend one day, entire day learning about how things are happening. And this, uh, I mean, every site has finished two visits and the response has been so exemplary that we have said that in the next year, which is the current year, they have to visit another two sites to get gain insight into how other systems and other hospitals work. So in this aspect, what we basically, I mean, in the QI we wanted to do is, this is the, this is the reality. There are sites with the lower than what you want kind of outcome rate, and there are sites who are doing better than what, what rest of us are doing kind of thing. And what two purposes are for the quality improvement is to reduce the variability and to improve the outcome. Now for this size sites, we have categorically told them that you need to look at your clinical care map because they need some clinical care improvement because you can't, you can't do any type of quality improvement is not going to improve you from here to come anywhere. So for the quality improvement, one aspect is reducing variability, but we just didn't want to bring the units from this to come towards this. What we wanted to do was to shift the entire curve to the right so that all the sites improve. And that's the innovation part, and that's what we are supporting and telling the sites. And our hope is that over as years go by, and it's not only neonatology, in every field people have recognized the QI as an important activity. And this is the seriousness that we are anticipating that CEOs, when they take around the people, in their hospitals and they will show us. With that, what we wanted to see is that now with Canada, we are on the right path with a lot of activities. So it's not only one, we also part, we collaborate with Canadian Pediatric Surgery Network led by Eric Skarsgård. We develop Canadian Neonatal Transport Network led by Kyung Sin Lee, who is at SickKids and we are currently working with the developing, because the outcomes of these babies were not great. And we are also following these babies in the Canadian Neonatal Follow-up Network, where all these less than 29 weeks week babies across the country are uniformly assessed at 18 to 20 months for the neurodevelopmental progress. And then we are just analyzing the result. 
but we also participate in a lot of other activities with the center being the network and uh, in terms of uh, pulmonary hypertension and neonatal echo, neonatal imaging, and the bright child spore, which Dr. Miller and Annette Majnamer is leading from Montreal. Once we achieved the Canadian aspect under control, we wanted to see that how can we take it further because there are still other countries who are reporting different and better outcome than us. And that's where I established what I call INEO, which is the international network. And it stemmed from uh, one of our fellow Tetsuya who came from Japan and he indicated that the care as well as the outcome is quite different. So he brought Japanese network, network data with him. We compared Japan and, and Canada and we identified, so the blue is Japan, red is Canada, that our outcomes are not as good as Japan for small babies, whereas in some 29 weeks and onwards babies, we are better than them. So we both need to learn, we both needed to identify what we can learn, and that stemmed the development of what I call INEO. So currently 11 countries recognize this as an important adventure initiative and are participating in this INEO, where we are comparing the data from all these 11 countries and looking at who is good for which outcome. I can tell you that this is the data from 2007 to 13. These countries have that network and then they have already done their own analysis and call, call us uh, benchmarking and now they want to combine it to see which where is the area that we need to learn. And in the preliminary analysis we found out that there are countries which have better outcomes. So this is same orientation, standardized ratio, anything less than one means your observed rate is lower than expected, anything more than one your observed rate is higher than expected. This is UK, Spain, Israel, Canada, Japan, Australia, Sweden, and Switzerland. And you can see there are countries like Sweden, Switzerland, and Japan which have better outcome in terms of composite outcome. So we broke it down to see that where can we make improvement and you can see now Switzerland is here. So their mortality is higher. So they're good in composite but they're more not good in mortality. Same way Sweden is not good in necrotizing anthropolytis. They're good in composite outcome. So every network has something to learn and every network has things to, to gain. So this initiative is could not have been possible without the help of all these network collaborators and in collaboration with CAPC and you can see Elaine attending our first meeting. We just had our second meeting and we all are gung-ho on going and continuing to identify variations and identify practice that can be changed. So with that, what we converted, not only the collaboration, but the knowledge and leading towards understanding and be wise how to use this knowledge. We don't believe that future is next, next exit. We think that future is just ahead and we need to embrace that. Having said all these things, good things about the network, I can also, I, I want, also want to mention that there are challenges. You need to bring people together. You need to keep interest and enthusiasm going. People do not want to change. If things are stable, they just want to rock, not rock the board, continue and then not look beyond. So it's it's a challenge. You we in, you need to include everybody. You don't need you know, every everyone's opinion matters, and everyone has a good suggestion. Look at the leadership. Look at look at the succession. And one of the biggest challenges is the funding. We have been fortunate that the CIHR team has been funded to do this activity, and that we continue to do. In addition, there are other challenges like privacy and confidentiality. It's getting bigger and bigger and uh, more and more difficult. I had to negotiate with 20 lawyers in these 11 countries to make sure that I'm not going to look at their data and find that 23 weeker in a remote village in Sweden. That's not the idea. It's to compare and learn from each other. Research ethics board is another challenge because every ethics board has its own questions and qualms about what we collect and how we do it and how we do our business. And again, resistance from status quo. People do not want to change. So all this needs to be understood as well as acknowledged and, and, and cleared before you continue to do any network kind of activity. However, it's not to dis discourage anybody. It is still possible. 
and we have this main motto that if you you can do what I cannot do, I can do what you cannot do. But if we get together, we can do even great things. So for us, what we have is a human being uh, came a, from hunter gatherer step to the area of wisdom, and I think what we need is now a lot of networking, understanding, talking, learning from each other, and be wise about what we do. And it's quite important that uh, for us now, opposite of networking is not working. And I think that should be the motto. To conclude, I think network needs to go beyond the idea of just comparing the data. For quality improvement, immersive engagement in doing so is the key to success. We Everybody needs to be have an open, collaborative learning attitude that leads to improvement across the board. And in this era of accountability, I think networking is key. Because all the administrators are coming and asking us, you are good, but how good are you? in comparison to. In the end, I would like to acknowledge the team. I mean, Shu and I keep on giving lectures. It is these are the people who work behind the scenes and uh, make these things happen. This is the team at the Mother Infant Care Research Center at Mount Sinai Hospital. But it's not only those. There are a lot of other people, the investigators at each site, the quality improvement investigator, I knew investigator, the executive committees, abstractors who diligently collect this data, patients, families, and other organizations that have helped us to reach to the stage that we are. So in the end, what we wanted to do, as I mentioned, we want to bring the bottom guy to the top so that we all look like this, and importantly, not only embrace each other and learn, we also look up so that we can reach to a better height. I will stop here and take any questions. All right. Thank you. Great presentation. Really great example of, 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 of seeing a problem, developing that network, and then then seeing all those opportunities to grow that network from a from a national success to an international success. So it was really, really a great presentation. Um, so this is a, this is the audience's opportunity to post any comments or questions that you would like to just uh, enter those into the question box. Um, one of the questions uh, that I had was around, you know, you, you've certainly demonstrated from the CN, the research and, and the projects that CNN initiated numerous improvements in the Canadian landscape for uh, neonatal outcomes over that period of time. One of the things that we've been, a lot of people in the child and youth healthcare community have looked at for a while is uh, is the, the report card from UNICEF. And one of those measures is around infant mortality and Canada doesn't score very well in that. Can you, is there any, do you have a comment on that? Like as to what, like we've, you've demonstrated what looks to be great success and, and when comparing internationally, Canada fares quite well in a lot of those, but yet in that report card, we seem to score quite low in that one particular area of, of infant mortality. Mm -hmm. So, so thank, thanks, Doug, for that question. So, infant mortality is not. Uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, there are there are different issues because uh, we looked at, at the that's Canada point of view as well as compared our data with the Finland and UK and USA and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that there is a, a the majority of mortality now occurs in a very small and immature babies, and there is one issue that uh, people need to define and clearly articulate as to what they count as a live birth. Because learning from this international network, when I ask the question, what is your live birth? In Japan, anything that moves is live. Mm -hmm. Whereas in other countries, anybody who is less than 22 weeks, they won't even come into the equation. Mm -hmm. Or in some countries, less than 23 weeks will not come into equation. So if you are not in the denominator, you're never going to be in the numerator. Hmm the rate so i think we need to understand and for that what we did was we looked at the only mortality of the babies who are more than 24 weeks that's where or more than 28 weeks and when you splice the data like more than 28 weeks then you can see that all those differences starts to disappear because of the counting i mean that's one aspect is counting yeah. the second aspect is the care i mean in the japan we based on the data that they showed we went to their i mean we sent the teams to japan to see that what they do and they are pretty hands-on and very aggressive at the small gestation age babies kind of very small babies and they work on them 
it's like uh, you know in the 10 years ago our mortality for 24 week gestation age baby was 90 percent it's only then when we started working on them and work for the improving the care now we are down to 50 percent so they are working on 22 and 21 weeks to make that happen kind of thing mm -hmm. so that's an, another issue of uh, access to care or type of care or how the care is being provided mm -hmm. and the third thing a part of the infant mortality that we probably will not be able to have a handle as neonatal is the post neonatal mortality once they go home and then the social inequality social disparities between the countries probably is also a driving factor for difference in infant mortality and I think that's also an area that needs to have some work. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, one of the other questions that came in was around uh, the challenges in sharing data across uh, various jurisdictions, whether it be internationally, I'm sure there's challenges, but even within Canada, uh, sharing uh, health information across provincial jurisdictions is often poses challenges. And, and that was one of the things you identified in your in one of your slides. Do you see, is there anything that you see coming from a, you know, policy perspective or anything that is going to make that easier or more difficult? Or do you see any change in that landscape as far as facilitating that kind of health, sharing of health information across the Canadian landscape, at least? Yeah. So I haven't heard uh, anything as far as the, because now the, I mean, uh, before five years, it was easy. But in the last five years, this has been becoming difficult and difficult with the, because the, uh, before five years, we used to just deal with the research ethics boards, and if ethics boards approved, then we were fine. But now research ethics boards is being layered over by the privacy and security officers at each institute. So it's not uncommon for me to spend 10 hours of my every month to talk to one of the privacy officer and security officers and explain the reasoning why we are doing. I think one thing I have seen that may help a little bit is harmonization activity that people are thinking of planning for ethics approval. Because I mean, in Quebec, there is something like that happening, but otherwise it's like every ethics board, you have to individually go and talk and satisfy. And some say, oh, this is an identifier. Some say this is not identifier. It is, it is challenging and uh, it is becoming more challenging and I would like to see that kind of help coming along the way with, the, with this kind of promotion of the work to show them that look, this is, here we are not sitting here to identify any baby. We are here for the global good. And uh, I haven't seen anything active happening, but uh, if anybody I need to pitch for that, I would be happy to do so. Yes, we were hoping you had 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 heard of something uh, maybe that we hadn't because we we often have at CAFC with our CPDSN program we run into those same challenges of sharing information across the provincial boundaries. So, unfortunately, we're uh, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, we did have a comment come in from Akhil. Uh, he says, a great initiative of getting the world together. He says, I do feel the mortality in extremely premature uh, infants also reflects societal societal acceptance of quality of life. Regions may work differently, and we may be withdrawing the care early as compared to other countries. I, uh, I think it is possible, and uh, that's why one of the initiatives we have done for the Canadian network is to ask them to give us data on all births at that particular given gestation rather than just those admitted to the intensive care unit or who received intensive care. Because the, un, unless we get all the number and denominator, we, we won't be able to say that how many were offered and how many were not offered care. Mm -hmm. But you, you are completely and absolutely right that there are differences not in the country, within the country, as well as between international arena as well. Mm -hmm. Even in Canada, there are units where uh, it may not be as proactive approach as other units at a given gestational age. And it's a... It's also a question that how confident are we on gestational age and people have questioned that aspect as well. So it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to tease out unless we have all the denominators and all the data. And we do collaborate with StatScan to see that how many babies we are missing so that those who are missing at let's say 23 weeks, we count them that they did not survive because otherwise they would have to come to one of the units to be cared for. And if you look at that way, then the survival data does not look that great. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, the, 
What's the uh, future look like for INEO as far as growth? Are you seeing more interest from other countries around the world, or have you do you have sort of the the the, the countries that are interested are already part of it, or or, or is it is is there more opportunities for growth? It is, it is expanding. I mean, uh, last year we added two more, so Italy and Finland. So Finland has a uh, data on entire. So what one of the premises we kept was uh, in building the INEO was that uh, we need kind of a as much as possible complete national picture rather than only a local or a regional pic or like a one unit or two unit picture at the local regional or the national representation so for that purpose these are the 11 countries which have national networks and national databases that have been participating so it started with the eight countries now we are 11 and uh, what we are now trying to venture is to help developing countries so not to join in this whole network but at least to give them the platform that they should be using to collect the data. So in the event that they come become successful and develop that platform, and at some stage they want to compare themselves with the rest of the world, they have a comparable terms and definitions that they can use. So that's our next approach. In terms of the countries, we tried uh, to get bigger countries into joining. We are still working and it's uh, it's a, cu a couple of Nordic countries have been approached. Germany has been approached. And we tried U.S., but uh, unfortunately, U.S. itself does not have a like Canadian neonatal network. There is no U.S. neonatal network. Mm -hmm. However, we felt that there are statewide uh, neonatal networks, and we approached. But uh, the, those are the lawyers I could not get through. <laughs> I had to give up because they, they will not send the data and they basically refused. Yeah. Elaine, did you have a comment? Yeah, I have a couple of a couple of comments and questions. First of all, Prakash, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> as Doug has said, what an excellent presentation and uh, INEO um, as well as CNN here in Canada have has has come a long, long way. So congratulations to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think CAFC and, and Doug, myself, uh, our whole network across the country really, really shares your passion and commitment to that, um, to networking and, and the need for, uh, for true collaboration. So certainly no, no argument uh, from this side and how important what you're doing is for the niche population that, um, that you're focusing on. And uh, our collaboration has meant a great deal. A couple, couple of questions and comments. Um, I wonder if you could speak to, you know, we, we've talked, Doug sort of took us to the end of the spectrum or, or one of our questions, one of our um, colleagues took us to the end of the spectrum on policy and, you know, the impact on policy, and, and we all know how difficult that is because of provincial barriers, because of provincial jurisdictions and differences and, and so forth and so on, not to mention the privacy um, and confidentiality um, issues that are perhaps getting more difficult as opposed to um, um, more collaborative. But can you start by speaking to the barriers of uptake? You know, it's one thing to have the evidence. Mm -hmm. The evidence is based on solid research, uh, clearly through through the work of CNN, and you've demonstrated that so well in today's presentation. But we also know that there are barriers to change, to practice change. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to that a little bit, Prakash? Yeah, so I completely agree. There are barriers to change, but to what we have observed, I mean, I think the uh, big example I can give is antenatal steroid. I mean, it was shown to be effective in 1972, uh, and the policy came in effect in 1992. So it took 20 years yeah. for organization to say this should be done and stuff like that. I think what has happened with the Internet and electronics, as well as our activity, is that that gap has come down. So now what happens is that when 130 of us meet together, which does not only include neonatologists, there are dietitians, respiratory therapists, and pharmacists, and administrator, we get together and each of us present what we are doing and why we are doing and what is the evidence. So we every three monthly look at what is happening 
for prevention of let's say infection in Canada and every mm-hmm. three months we go through the each of the item that we have collected is there a more evidence is there a less evidence can we upgrade it to a stronger recommendation or a lower recommendation and this is being constantly fed back to the unit the other thing we do is on the other hand is we ask the unit that of this we don't want you to embrace everything and make sure that you do everything just want to know what are the things you are doing and what are the things you are contemplating right so that gives a little bit of onus as to oh why are we not doing this is there a reason why we are not doing or is there a reason that we just don't want to change kind of thing right so that constant right. bombardment of uh, information back and forth is leading the sites to think that okay well you know montreal has put a big poster in their unit that this is a baby space and as soon as you enter baby space you have to wash your hands right let's do this and some of the things are experiential rather than uh, evidence based but people have adopted because it, it makes sense mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. with this community and collaboration it has come down however there are still people who believes in one way and they will only go one way to montreal from toronto despite there are four other ways right 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 and that that definitely does describe the barrier there's no question yes. I, i think uh again doug raised um a very interesting um comment as well around the whole um issue of infant mortality and the unicef uh, 2013 enosante report where we certainly didn't look very good as a country um i i was thrilled to hear that finland is now part of ineno um because i think that they their infant mortality is probably one of the best in the world uh certainly maybe one of the top 3 anyway and i i think there may be learnings there that uh Canada can benefit from you know i i i'm intrigued by the you know comment of are we giving up too early uh compared to other countries and 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 you're right it it could be in how we're counting but i i think that that's a very positive um enhancement to INEO's collaboration yeah absolutely I mean and they i was trying for them for last two years and finally broke through their barriers in terms of uh, <laughs> But their yeah. data is held by government so it's every jurisdiction has different different aspect like finland the whole data set is held by the government so you have to talk to the government to engage and to get the data and we had fortunate collaborators over there who diligently worked and they got the data i think there is a i mean i, I don't want to say it's only the counting is the issue there are social constructs that i think we may have to face in canada that we may have to change in canada that happens once the baby go home in yeah. what kind of environment nutritional status exactly sleep, yeah. all those things we have to work because they have kind of a one indigenous population with not much of influx mm. and uh, they have been able to sustain that social infrastructure like in the sweden I mean every corner has a midwife interesting which uh, basically so the women they do not have to go far right because yes. of course in 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 our indigenous population our first nations aboriginal um it it's 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 a huge issue yeah it's a huge huge issue that that we haven't we haven't uh, we haven't hit yet mm-hmm. uh, is is there any um any involvement uh i mean i know that many of our um many of our um level 3 nurseries many of our academic centers across the country are engaged with our northern communities so um are 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 some of those communities um uh, engaged in in your da- databases prakash so it's not not like a direct engagement and stuff but uh, we do get the baby's data from those community okay and uh, we at at so that was i mean we wanted to do in such a way that uh, looking at the maternal re- postal code and identify those uh, sources kind of thing but that has been squashed by many people saying that no you can't have it privacy so again the yeah. identifier and privacy and the purpose was to aggregate on a general basis not an individual basis however we did find that uh, there are certain conditions like congenital anomaly like gastroschisis is higher up north in canada and it's increasing yeah yeah 
So I think uh, we we once we have uh, some handle, we show some productivity, then probably it will be next step to go to the people and say, look, we want to compare the outcome within regions and then see that what are the differences and how can we make it better. How can we help exactly? And I'll just I don't want one one last comment slash question, Prakash. Um, have you done any work with Kai High and or Accreditation Canada? So with the Kai High, we when one of the fellow that one of the picture I showed, we have initiated because what we wanted to look with the Kai High was to now okay, these are the babies going home. What happens to them in the first three to five years? Because we know those are the time that they are the highest resource users. Right. And can we predict them? Can we identify them? And can we proactively develop some system for those babies compared to those who probably are like other normal newborns? Right. And so that process is going on. And I think with the Kai Hai, like the ISIS developing the portals across the universities in Ontario. Mm -hmm. So that you can access the ISIS data, you can't take it out. Don't you can analyze and leave it all those things. But with those openings, I think it's becoming little easier. So yeah. we will we'll see this first project how it goes. Similarly, we are doing with the bond. So bond is now going to submit the data in Kaihai or ISIS. So right. We'll have that link of a, of a joint database from Baby. I I, th I think you'll find that to be very very uh, very helpful. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. All right. Well, I think we're pretty much out of time. We don't have any other questions or comments from the audience. So, uh, Dr. Shah, if you had, is there any sort of closing comments that you'd like to leave the audience with? No, uh, we'll be, we are happy. We collaborate with uh, other uh, networks as well as there are a lot of uh, non-neonatal networks that I have been part to develop and uh, build. If anybody has any comments, suggestions, questions, or needs some more input, at Sinai's email. All right. Well, thank you for a great presentation. Again, it, it certainly uh, you demonstrated what was a, a great Canadian success story and, and really really an opportunity for Canada to, to influence the world in this area. So it's really, really some great work. So thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, thank you to the audience for coming. We do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And it's great when you can watch live as you can uh, add your questions and comments to really enrich the discussion. But when you can't watch live, we do record these sessions and make them available after the fact on the can. Uh, next week on February February 24th, we'll have a special episode called The Zika Virus, A Global Issue in a Canadian Context. So we're going to ha hear from Dr. Jonathan Goube, who is a medical microbiologist from Public Health Ontario, who's going to give us a, try to give us a separate fact from fiction, I, I think, uh, to tell us what we really need to know about the Zika virus uh, in the Canadian context, uh, talk about the virus itself and what, uh, as, as Canadian health centres, we might need to be prepared for when uh, tra Canadian travellers may be returning from areas affected by the virus. Uh, and then following that, we'll be hearing from another one of the CIHR uh, research chairs, uh, Dr. Jonathan Weiss, uh, as well as a few of his colleagues, Dr. Barry Isaacs and, uh, Dr. Barry Isaacs and Yana, Yanni Hamdani, uh, and they're going to talk about the health of young adults with developmental disabilities across Ontario, their results from the Healthcare Access Research in Development Disabilities Program, also known as HCARD, and you can, I think it's hcard.ca if you want more information uh, before we get to that session, but that's going to be uh, sure to be a, a very enlightening a session on uh, re research that tells us what happens to children with uh, developmental disabilities, particularly autism, as they transition to adult life. So that's going to be a really interesting session as well, I think. Uh, so some great uh, stuff coming up. Thanks to our again to Dr. Shaw for his great presentation, and thanks for joining us today. And we hope to see you back here next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you.